Welcome to the intersection of technology, cybersecurity, and society. Welcome to ITSP Magazine. Knowledge is power, now more than ever. All right, everybody, this is Audio Signals. I'm usually here with my partner and business uh, partner and podcast host partner and uh, conversational partner, Sean, but he's traveling today. And uh, so it's uh, I'm, I'm here, but thankfully and good for you. It's not just me because it will be very, very boring. As I often say, I always have uh, some uh, guests that I have in interesting story and that's the reason why i accept uh, the the pitch that comes often from uh, either a review of a book or a pr agency and sometimes it's uh, it's exciting and i can see a story sometimes i don't now here my problem with uh, kurt davis hey kurt how are you doing uh, just say hello yeah, how are you? Well, i'll keep going good um i'm gonna pass the ball to you soon but i was explaining my my problem here is that sometimes you, you, you find that there is a particular angle or a topic that your guest is well-versed into. In your case, I'm like, what are we going to talk about here? Because you have experience in startup and technology, Silicon Valley leadership, then you travel, and then well-being, and then uh, you wrote your third book, and I believe you're going back to talking about leadership and lighthouses, which for me, it's traveling, adventure, and also leadership, right? So I, I'm going to throw the ball at you. And to start, you tell us a little bit about yourself. And then uh, I think there is a way to connect all of this together. And, uh, and, and we'll see where we go in this 30 minutes conversation. So Kurt, a little bit about yourself. Uh, well, thanks for having me. And uh, appreciate uh, the introduction. Um, I, uh, I guess, you know, I always like to say I kind of spent my life uh, half abroad uh, out of the US and half of it uh, in the US working in technology, uh, mostly um, a little few teaching stints, which is something I love to do. And uh, uh, so yeah, no, I spent the first six years of my career in Asia, started off in Japan teaching and then worked in finance in Hong Kong, and then started a company in China for two years and uh, sold, sold that and then went to uh, San Francisco or Silicon Valley in 2006, or sorry, uh, 2003, and uh, really kind of early days. Actually, no, it was 2006. It was 2006 and um, <laughs> got into startup world. So it was early days of San Francisco. Uh, you know, pre Y Combinator and all that and kind of cut my teeth there and ended up at a startup and rode that for about seven years doing mobile payments, which took me back to Asia, to Japan, to build out the Asian business and also allowed me to uh, go to places like Middle East and India, uh, Southeast Asia and got to really see the world. And then uh, about 2017, I got, you know, it was basically burned out, was wanted to do something else. So I took a backpack and traveled Africa. And during that time, I taught at entrepreneurship centers, uh, worked at nonprofits, uh, you know, did, doing anything from orphanages to building water wells to, to whatnot, just learning about different things in the world in Africa, uh, often, you know, the last continent, they say, to be developed uh, and, uh, and, and to, be, to be really infiltrated with capitalism uh, in many ways. Um, so I came back to the Southeast uh, where I grew up and North Carolina and Tennessee and uh, just was working with family and helping family taking care of them during the pandemic. And then uh, that's come to an end. And now I'm running a new startup. And so uh, during the pandemic lockdown, I wrote two books, one about my time in Africa and then one called Navigate to the Lighthouse, which is about the startup journey that I was on for about seven years uh, working on business development deals. So as I said at the beginning, where to start, right? So I, I would say maybe we can start in the middle because 
when I was reading about the things that you've done, uh, that finding soul and from Silicon Valley to Africa, which was your book before the lighthouse, I felt like you, you know, you mentioned you kind of got a little burnout. You needed a break. You needed an adventure. I'm, I'm assuming you were rediscovering, you know, maybe your mission and and an objective in life. So I would love to know how then you decided, because it's funny enough, then you, you're telling people how to find their lighthouse. And I feel like, was that middle uh, phase of your life, or at least what you tell us, like that that you actually did find your lighthouse there? You see, my, my question it's, is, how do the two things connect? Yeah, so I think it's, it's interesting. I think when, you know, I was... I was kind of burnt, you know, I was burned out of a lot of things, personal life as well as, as business. And I took the time to go to Africa more just to explore and just take time off. I, I wasn't searching for anything particularly. Uh, I just like to travel and I like to see different cultures and places. And it's the continent I had not spent time on. And so I went and did that with no real purpose in mind, uh, but to uh, just to see what that culture and world and those people were about. Um and then, but while I was doing that, of course, I, uh, in finding, so I talk about the journey, but also my inward journey, how it started to change me, like things I started to prioritize changed things that, um, I saw that I really enjoyed doing like teaching and, and other things came to, came to bear. And so I started to realize like, well, if I really enjoy these other things, why don't I spend more time doing them? Why do I spend so much time working at companies or startups? Why am I so dedicated to that? Uh, and, uh, really with not a big reward. I mean, it was some, some, it was a decent reward, but like there was nothing exciting about what I was doing. Uh, you know, we weren't, our company wasn't a Facebook or something, uh, or, you know, whatnot, but the, um, so I think, I think that kind of changed my perspective about like things I was doing and where I was going. Uh, and during the time I was teaching on to, to the startup centers, uh, I was teaching about how to do business development sales. And that was the foundation of the next book, which was called Navigate to the Lighthouse, which was this is book about business development. And the lighthouses are how do you find as an entrepreneur, these lighthouse deals that can change the trajectory of your company. Uh, so from being, you know, a, an average company to getting to a point where it really grows to the, to the, you know, tens and hundreds of millions of dollars. So that's what that book is about. Um, and, uh, um, in some ways, your, uh, your, you know, your question discussion, did, did it help me find my lighthouse in life? And I think that's an interesting question. Uh, and, and I think, I think in many ways that travel, that time, uh, writing that time off, uh, really did. It, it kind of let me see that it's okay to, you know, I have always liked building companies. There's nothing wrong with doing things you love. And, and so like, so I said, you know, there's nothing wrong with entrepreneurship and I, and, and just maybe finding the right thing for me, right? Like the right thing. And then finding something that has a more of a mission of maybe helping people or, um, or, uh, you know, uh, or in a geography that I am I'm interested in because I wanted to do something back in the Southeast. So, you know, it, it just gave me a peace of mind of saying, you know, you can be you, you can do the things that you love to do. And you don't have to answer to anybody and um, uh, you go do them. And, uh, you know, uh, and I think one of the things that really resonated from my time in Africa was how they were building entrepreneurship was a ray of hope for them. It was a ray of, uh, uh, of being able to have autonomy in many cases where you don't have that in some of these places. And uh, but they were building their companies around helping the community, helping their immediate community. Uh, which I thought was fascinating because, you know, so often in, in um, Silicon Valley or New York, you know, everything is about how do you become a global company and, and, and yeah. you know, tomorrow, but very little of it's how do I actually help my community? Like if you think of all the Silicon Valley entrepreneurs and all of them said, we're just going to sit here and try to solve homelessness together. They'd probably do it. <laughs> They'd probably figure it out, but they don't because it doesn't scale yeah. to hundreds of billions of dollars. But so what I'm trying to say is that that was a very profound thing that influenced me. So now that I'm doing this new company, the start of it is right in the community, right in North Carolina, right in Charlotte is this company I found was doing this thing, has caught on. And I think it can be expanded nationwide. But right now, the focus is right there and solving some problems in the healthcare system there. 
Um, and then we'll go from there. I love that. And so let's talk about the lighthouse, because when I think about a lighthouse, there's been always said the reference. You see that in a lot of logos, <laughs> it's referring to being the safe harbor. You, it's referred to being the, the guide light. But it also could mm -hmm. be referred to yourself. Like when you do something for the community, you may be that lighthouse, that guide and inspire and keep safe others. So I'm, I'm just saying the, the, the lighthouse symbol is very, very philosophical and very inspiring because I feel like while you find yourself, you also help others and, and the helping others help you to find yourself. So mm -hmm. with this in mind, yeah. I would love your, your perspective on that. And also maybe as you do that, why do you call it a lighthouse deal? Like I, sure. I've seen that in the into the book. Like, what what does the lighthouse in that case means? Yeah, um, well, I think to your point of being a beacon of hope or beacon of a lighthouse in communities is actually very important. It's actually, if you want to distill it to something, it's being a leader in your community. It's not it's not a thing everyone aspires to do. In very fact, very few people do it, um, and they are our political leaders often. Um, but if you, if you aspire to be someone that wants to step up in your community and do the right things or do what you think is the right thing, uh, and, and help others, you know, do, you know, uh, you know, I think naturally people look to that and they gravitate towards that. And then that lighthouse shines uh, along bigger, bigger areas and more things and kind of gives you more ideas and things to do. It gives you more opportunities. So like you said, it can benefit you as well as it benefits others. Um, and I think the same simile uh, is uh, applied to the lighthouse deal because the lighthouse deal is saying, uh, there's a big deal I want to get as an entrepreneur. I think I can close it. That lighthouse will shine uh, a, a net, a, a wide uh, you know, uh, ray of light across other opportunities that are similar a new market, a new opportunity. And that lighthouse is that shining beacon. And so, um, and so the goal is to get that deal or one of those deals that then open up the light to the other deals. Uh, and so very, very similar, uh, very similar in that regards. Yeah. And I, and I think you, you actually talk about, and we talked a little bit about this before we start recording about how, technology actually plays or can play a role in all of this. I mean, I'm thinking you go in Africa, you're thinking a lot of people that haven't been there, you know, being behind in a lot of things and how maybe with the right use of technology can make things a little bit easier. Um, working remotely, for example, or having the structure, but you do need the infrastructure to be able to do all of that. So when you were experiencing uh, your teaching there, were you able to do maybe more because of technology? I mean, or, or you were feeling like, damn it, there really, there is really not a, the same level. Uh, you know, there is a lack of opportunity here because there is a lot, a lack of technology. Um, I mean, there's technology. I mean, the, the wireless networks are plenty fine and capable. Uh, the Chinese have built out these systems. Um, uh, is there the same servers and routings and, you know, uh, opportunity? Absolutely not. Uh, there are computers, but there are even, um, you know, there's more PCs. There's no Mac really out there. Um, uh, there are, like I said, there's some iPhones, very small, but mostly Androids and mostly Chinese built or uh, some type of Korean built Android. Um, and so the, the, the hardware kind of exists, the wireless technologies exist. Um, and they certainly can use more of it. Um, and, uh, so I would just say they're doing with what they can. It's really a mobile first world, right? Like everything is done on mobile, especially when mm. you get out to the rural areas where everything is mobile. There's no PCs, like there's no laptops. Nobody's carrying them around. Uh, it's all mobile phones. So it's mobile centric, mobile first, you know, 
and and then how do you you know attract users on mobile phones and how do you solve the problems that we work on on mobile phones um and that's really it mm. so. and what about when you get to to help to develop uh, infrastructure like you know solar power or alternatives to to get what they need like the basic of electricity and so forth well, i think outside the cities there's obviously uh there's a lot of companies like mcopa uh and similar companies who are um leasing or renting like solar power cells for your small house uh, or your mm. you know whatnot or your living situation um that can come with like a little TV or a little heating stove and things like that. So there's stuff like that happening uh, in Africa. Uh, there's a lot of kind of monthly billing arrangements like that. And so. Um, But what drives so, yeah. them? And, and the reason why I'm asking you about technology is because then I, I want to go to when you, you came back into a technology rich world. And, and you re realize, or maybe you did realize it during the trip, that there is the people element, right? Maybe here we focus too much on technology, but there that maybe they don't have the technology we have here. They're driven by giving back to their community. They're giving by, driven by relationships. So I, I'm understanding that there is the trade-off between technology and, and people where we shouldn't forget that ultimately the people that make and use technology are people. So uh, how do you then humanize again technology once you discover that we do have technology here, but maybe we're, we're not inspired as we should? Mm. Well, I think we take it for granted, right? I mean, there's just so yes. much of it <laughs> and it's so accessible. The next, you know, the next new software, the next new app, the next new thing, it just, It, there's so much of it that it's really hard to get our minds wrapped around any one thing. Right. Uh, and then when we do, it's just, we take it for granted. Whereas, you know, I think, I think with a lot of them, anything that's new or exciting really draws attention and really uh, gets them engaged. Right. So, I mean, at the humanizing element, I don't know. I think people just generally, you know, It's a different it's a different world out there. I mean, people in Africa kind of just like walk over each other's houses and they kind of go in and out and they're, you know, they wouldn't, you know, if you like I live in this neighborhood in Knoxville, like you wouldn't even think about going to your neighbor's house and walking in their door and knocking, um, you know, much less getting in their yard if they don't, you know, get in the wrong yard, someone can shoot you. Right. Like. In Africa, they, they're just walking around, enjoying themselves, hanging out. They all know each other. They're all supportive. They all hang out. I'm sure there's competition. There's a lot of competition because there's so many people, but it's also a very different community feel. And, um, and, and just, you know, it, it, there's a whole different element there of, of just kind of being together, being human, uh, Ubuntu, like, you know, this Ubuntu culture they have. So, uh, yeah. And then, and, you know, now with technology, you can argue that, We're even more segregated, right? Like we, we sit sit at home and we look at our phones all the time, and uh, we seek personal connection through mobile phones. And uh, you know, rather than walking outside and talking to the person who lives at the house next to you, right? Like, or like yeah. in an apartment complex. Like, you know, I don't even know how that. You know, I don't know how the big cities work. I don't hang out really in New York or anything. But like, you know, how many people actually know they know their know their neighbors? And even bother to talk to them. They're probably like, I don't want to talk to people. Like, you know, just give me my mobile phone, right? Like, it's just the the way the world has evolved, unfortunately, especially with our politics now, is just different. Yeah, yeah. So based on these, you know, this this deal, uh, the lighthouse, the navigate to the lighthouse. Uh, how do you advise people to to decide? or pick or get inspired by what, what is the deals that they should follow? I mean, should they follow the technology for the sake of it? Should they follow the heart? Is there a magic formula? And I'm being ironic with a magic formula here, but what is that the main advice that, that you can give to people when they do look to grow their business? Um, and what yeah, the book is about pretty much. Yes, yeah, sure. The lighthouse really is something where you already kind of know that there's this deal in the, horizon that you'd like 
maybe it's a far reaching deal or they're like, Oh, if I could just get that deal that that's, you know, they could, I think they could really benefit from our technology or our product. And you sit there and think about it, but you're like, there's just no way they talk to me. I don't know, even know how to talk to them. I don't know what to say to them. I don't even know how to get to them. Right. And so you have that and, and you're like, well, I'm stuck. I'm selling to these same things. My business is incrementally growing percents here, percent there. I want it to grow 100%. So then you have to sit down and say, okay, well, how do I do that? How do I go get that deal? How do I resource it? How do I put time against it, people and money? And, and so you, you know, in theoretically, section one, we talk about how do you think through that? How do you make a plan? How do you do the analysis? How do you think about from their perspective, what are the economics they're looking at? Uh, who are the 10 companies you'd like to approach? Who in your network knows these people? Uh, then get out there and start talking to them. I mean, you got to talk to people, right? This is biz dev. So you got to, you know, hey, you know, what are you thinking? Because a lot of times you don't know that that company might even be talking to you or be thinking about what you're doing. You think you don't even think they have any interest, but in fact, they've got tons of interest, but you didn't talk to them. So you don't know. And so like the part one is like that planning strategic phase and whatnot. And then the second part is actually kind of moving the chess pieces and getting your team involved into the deal. It's because these deals take a lot. So making sure your CEO's involved, your board's involved, your investors are helping, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and then, you know, making sure that there's your, your company is strategically positioned. And then the last part is kind of how you get the lighthouse to dance, right? Like, how do you get them to move? What do you say? How do you entice them? Uh, and all these things to get them to actually do a deal with you. Uh, so, yeah. You know, one thing that I'm thinking is, what if your lighthouse or your your goal, your objective, it's it really is out, out of your league or it really is maybe not the right deal that you should be following? I mean, kind of like a false, like a mirage, like, you know, if I could have that, but is that really what you should focus on? I mean, is there a part where you you analyze, uh, you know, what you what is that you're going for and is it worth it to then apply all this strategy to get there um i think you know it's how you it's how you risk manage <clears throat> so how do you actually like decide you know do you go after one deal or do you have to go five well i think the filter you have to start with you have to work on multiple things you know maybe up to 20 to start with and then you're trying to trying to um gauge which one of them could possibly fit and work so you're, you're, as you go, you're, you're kind of Xing certain things. This one's going to take too long. They're not responding at all, you know, and, you know, they're not taking, they're taking some meetings. Okay. So here's five who are taking meetings and now you're trying to, and like, you really probably can only get one and you could only, the company could probably only handle one. Uh, hmm. So you'd have to put a lot of resources on it. So yeah, that process of like, knowing which one to go after, knowing which ones to say no to as well, or just quit, you know, that's a whole process. And we talk about that in the first section. Um, but it's about, you know, resource allocation and then risk management and then making a decision which one to go after. And there's a leap of faith sometimes. It is a leap of faith. And are there signs that kind of show you on the way that you are? on the right path you know like yeah, when you do know, you so start... we call this it's a good question i mean that we call this the deal cycle and so the trick is you mm. got to know the deal cycle and you have to know what they're saying to you that indicates that they are interested you know whether it's they're saying yes we're very interested to okay well if you're very interested can you give me a timeline of commitment can you uh can you also sh sh give me some resources and let me, you know, start investing in the project uh, in some way that we can then trust that you're going to work with us. Like, like, but there's this certain green lights and indicators. And it's also, like I said, getting them to tell you they're interested, right? Like, you know, you can't be barking up, uh, you know, the wrong tree. And then yes. let's say you're barking up the right tree, but you keep chasing the tree. Uh you can't do it forever. You can't chase the tree up the cat forever. You can't cat up the tree forever. So, so the point being is you need to have them commit back to you. And like, and so, so there's a bit, there's a bit of, 
uh, that reciprocation that's important. Sounds like it's more of a psychological relationship dance, a human at a human level. I mean, I guess you, you know the product or the service is interesting. Otherwise, you wouldn't even be talking to them. But then it become like, can we really work together for for different reasons, maybe that than just the, the product that you're offering? Is that correct? Like, how then do you grow that when you have this deal? Are you really going to expand because? In this case, one plus one equal three or four instead of just right. two. And that's the goal, right? So, I mean, I think there's this planning when you're working together, when you're working, we call this working as a consultant. You're saying, well, here's the entry level point, but here's, here's where it can go. So let's, let's shoot for this long-term projected uh, exciting plan that we can work towards together. Um, and, uh, you know, and you put that on the roadmap, people get excited, right? Uh, that there's a bigger plan here. And, uh, but you got to start small, usually. Well, talking about small, I mean, who, who is the ideal as we start wrapping here a conversation? I mean, who you had in mind when you start writing this book? I mean, the, what kind of, was it like a particular industry you had in mind? Or this applies to many different industry or maybe some size, like it's a startup, is it? mom and pop is it, is it like yeah it's a, it's a good software? question i mean we, we we were a software a b2b software company and so that's really the sweet spot but the learnings can be applied to lots of different things we've had real estate agents who commented actually several real estate agents who really like it and i didn't didn't see that coming forward we've had uh you know, uh, you know, hardware sales business because the act of doing a deal or business development deal can be applied. Uh, maybe the pricing section was really specific to software as a service. Uh, and so like these things are, uh, but a lot of it's very applicable uh, um, across many, many aspects of business dealings, especially the first chapter in planning and the last chapter in strategy. Uh, sorry, in, uh, in, in communication, negotiation, planning, consulting, like that, those five or six chapters can work with anyone. Um, and like I said, a lot of people responded positively to that. So Very cool. Well, it's sounds interesting for, for a lot of different people in different industry and even the person that you may be starting to think about having a business and knowing what they're going to deal with in the, in the future. Um, Going back to, to where we started this, uh, with all your passion and different experience and the book that seems quite different, but they probably all come together because, you know, everything you do, it becomes a piece of what you are, you're next. What, uh, what do you see yourself doing uh, in the near and longer future? Is it another book in your, in your future? Is it another adventure, another <laughs> well, uh, discover? Yeah, I, I... Like I said, I started running this company, and so I like to build it. Uh, it's a yeah. kind of what I call post-pandemic company, so we're this new world we're living in. Uh, the mm -hmm. fact that people want to work temporarily and have flexibility, so we're, we're trying to provide that to uh, dentists, dental workers at the moment. And so we'd like to build out this platform and build a successful company over the next, call it three to four years. In the meantime, I'll be writing. Um um, probably be you know doing a little bit of blogging, but not much. And uh, well, I focus on the company, but I'm going to be writing about the company as we go, in hopes that afterwards they'll have another book to publish about the experience running this company, and uh, and share that experience again with people in a real time scenario where they can read what I was thinking and doing as I start as I was running this company, like uh, from from a real entrepreneur, you know, from one entrepreneur to the next, right? So any entrepreneur can read this. It wouldn't be applicable to just software, but to anything we're doing. So, so yeah, so I hope uh, build a company and write another book. And yeah, that's the, that's the immediate goal. And that's, if you want to end with this, is the beauty of technology where you can kind of with blogging or podcasting, or you can share your thoughts. You don't need to finish something and then say, oh, let me recap, let me, write my biography per se or my adventure right. you can actually do it as you go and i think that's probably the the best way to to share your lessons with other and to learn because maybe while you express something somebody that has already went where you are going now 
may have a different feedback. It's almost like an interactive way to to write a book or communicate. I mean, um, I'm just like putting a a little bit of an it's idealistic, good. you know. Yeah, it's it's a good idea, and it's something that I I, I think I'll consider. Time yeah. permitted. I think time is is when you're running a startup. It's hard to it's hard. It's, there's just a little time. Yeah, but I, I like oh, this yeah. idea of maybe posting as you go and getting feedback. You're like, hey, here's what's happening now, like, and just getting that feedback right. real time. That'd be cool. It's a good idea. Yeah. Well, in the well, if you if you go for that, I think there's a lot of. I mean, a few people doing it. I didn't invent this system, but again, you're right. It it takes time and uh, and it takes an audience. And I'm sure that with all your books and and adventures and experience, you you can definitely share a lot. So I hope as I thank you for being part of this uh, podcast with me and also video for people that are actually watching us. Um, I invite everybody that are listening to Audio Signals to check the notes on the podcast and there will be links to Kurt, uh, his social media, his website, so you can learn a little bit more about that. And uh, sure, pick up the book if you are in the uh, target audience or if you're looking for your soul in Africa or anywhere else, maybe... There is the other book too. So, <laughs> Kurt, uh, it was a pleasure. I, I learned like a lot like from this conversation, so I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it was a, appreciate a great time and enjoy the conversation. All right. We hope you enjoyed this conversation. If you learned something new and this story made you think, then share ITSP Magazine with your friends, family, and colleagues. If you represent a company and wish to associate your brand with our conversations, sponsor one or more of our columns. We hope you will come back for more stories and follow us on our journey. You can always find us at the intersection of technology, cybersecurity, and society.